Hi everyone and welcome to this stage. Today we will be delving into the world of decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. We're gonna briefly discuss the challenges and also where the industry is going. I'm here joined by three amazing uh, speakers. Um, Jack Dale from Beefy DAO, Matthew Schuti from Holochain and Dr. Nick Alman from Factory DAO. And they will help us shed light into the innovative and um, intricate world of DAOs. So DAOs have been greatly innovating a lot of fields and industries such as DeFi, gaming, and governance. However, they've also been facing some challenges whilst maturing, such as in the governance, decentralization, and community participation. So today we're gonna talk about some of these challenges, but we'll also delve into the solutions and how to upgrade DAOs for greater Web3 adoption. We'll kick off with some short intros. Uh, I'll start myself. I'm Laura Dendalowski. I'm a PR account executive at Luna PR, a leading Web3 um, PR and marketing agency. We're a global firm with presence in Dubai, the US, Portugal, and uh, my office, London. A bit about my background, I've been working in the tech industry for a few years now, started with a B2B tech PR and then moved on to Web3 PR. I'll uh, pass it on to you guys. Perfect. Is Hello, good morning. Uh, so yeah, I'm Jack, I'm the head of legal at BeefyDAO. Uh, I'm a solicitor by training uh, and fell down the crypto rabbit hole in about 2022. Fell deep and fell hard and now I do this full time. Um, Beefy is an unusual DAO. Uh, we're a yield optimizer protocol in DeFi across 30 different EVM blockchains. Um, but as a DAO, we have gone through our fair share of trials and tribulations, and I think that's really what I'm gonna be speaking to on the panel today. Um, so we were founded with three kind of core limitations. One was we had a token that was hard capped, fixed, one token, one vote, very inflexible in terms of governance. Uh, two was we gave all of the token away within the first month, which is a terrible idea, uh, left nothing for contributors or growth or any other kind of, yeah, strategies. Uh, and then finally, we also listed on a centralized exchange, had a massive bull run, and our founders were able to retire uh, successful and rich very early in the protocol's life, um, meaning that we had to hand over to the community and were kind of forcibly decentralized. Um, but despite those limitations, our DAO has grown to have over 15,000 token holders. We have a lot of participation. We are revenue generating, profit generating, um, and today we are growing rapidly. Um, so on this panel, it's great to speak with uh, leaders in the field who are building tools that can help us, and hopefully we can dive into some of that with, with Matt and Nick. Hello, hello. Uh, I'm Matt, or Matthew, Shooty. You can call me that, Mateo, whatever works best for you, I'm easy. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders and the director of business development for a project called Holochain. Holochain is not a blockchain, despite the name. Uh, it's not a platform. It's not one big network, even. It's just a pattern. It's a, a way to build applications where each application ends up being able to be run on just the devices of the users themselves. So each app ends up as its own separate encrypted network run by those people, whether there's two of them or 20 million of them. Right, uh, Holochain apps don't need tokens. You don't need to do staking, you don't need gas fees. It's literally just a, you wanna play this game, I wanna play this game, great, we can play this game together. And uh, I'll be speaking of a fair bit today in, when we get to the questions about the ways in which that enables some different kind of patterns of collaboration, coordination, communication uh, within DAOs and other sort of similar uh, ways of doing uh, coordination as a, as a community. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, my name's Nick. Um, I'm a scientist by background. Uh, I did a PhD in physics many years ago, um, and then spent about 10 years moving through academia, ending up in specializing in, in, in governance, institutional governance, governance design, governance theory, uh, with an explicit focus on collective intelligence. Um, 
And about 10 years ago, I built a decentralized organization inside an institution. And a few years later, the DAO happened. Um, and rather regretfully, I got DAO pilled at that point. Um, and I've not had much of a choice but to try to chase this dream of a world where we get um, massive scale decentralized organizations on the internet. Um, I've been in crypto for four years now. Um, I sort of made an entrance with a prediction market, which we're just about to relaunch, reputation-based prediction market. And throughout that process, we've, the last four years, we've been building um, kind of tools that I thought would push us into the next generation of DAOs uh, with an explicit focus on more reputation and collective intelligence oriented bits around uh, trying to push the token economics and decentralization forward of DAOs. Amazing, thank you all. Um, now we'll start the panel discussion. So my first question is about challenges. And also, like we know that DAOs have come a long way, but what are the essential elements for a DAO to be truly functional today? And what are the, some of the challenges that they face in widespread adoption? Um, Nick, if um, you wanna give your insights. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna let Jack do a lot of this one, I think, because he's experienced a lot of the pain, but I've seen plenty of it too. Um, the, my sort of crusade at the moment is, um, I met a chap last night who said he hated DAOs. And he said, and I asked him why, and he said, well, they're all scams. <laughs> and, you know, and, and they weren't DAOs, right? Because if they were properly DAOs, then it's, very more, it's much more difficult to scam, right? Because the, the accountability is shared across the, the network. Um, and, you know, the way in which the project is governed is sort of mutually... Uh, creates better trust models. Um, so where I think we've largely gone wrong is not actually doing DAOs, right? We've had DAOs in name only, um, and we've sort of pretended that this thing, which is actually a multi-sig and a Discord, is a DAO when it isn't. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll pass that on from you. Yeah, I think for us, um, it's been challenging to kind of grasp with what the decentralized aspect really means. Um, people will often criticize DAOs and say, you know, you're, you've got 20 people here who are kind of leading this whole process. They've got a lot more information than everyone else. Is that really a DAO? Um, but decentralization, you know, it's the goal. It's where we're all headed. But it's hard to look at anything right now and say that that is the model example of decentralization. Um, but when people do get frustrated um, about decentralization, it can really kind of calm down on the spirit to collaborate and innovate and push out the boundaries of what we can do with DAOs. Um, so a lot of our kind of challenges, at least in the last sort of two years, during this kind of more bearish market sentiment, has been apathy um, and the ability to kind of retain community. We at Beefy have a phenomenal community, um, and that's really what's, what's kept us going. Um, but that's a community that's unified by things like their love of degen strategies in DeFi and, and meme coins and NFTs, um, as much as it is you know, a, a community that's bonded together by a belief in the power of DAOs. Um, but we have managed to be successful in informing people and, and, and changing the standard a little bit to make people realize that decentralization is our progressive mission. And that's really what we mean by a DAO, is an organization that is working to automate and decentralize all of its functions. Um, so yeah, that's been our, our core challenge, I think. And, and I'll just, just briefly, for anybody in the room who's not familiar, uh, DAO means Decentralized Autonomous Organization. <laughs> that would have been um, useful to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember I posted something recently uh, just promoting the panel on LinkedIn, and somebody said, wow, I have no idea what half the words in that mean. <laughs> right? Um, and, but I think of these as, as ways of people being able to structure coordination um, with a couple of things, I'm sure there's more, but a couple of things come to mind for me around this. One is we're trying to avoid some of the concentrations of power that often, often happen in the traditional ways that we do organization, right? When we start a company or an, even a nonprofit, et cetera, we often concentrate power within a board of directors, an executive team, et cetera. And that can lead to some abuses of, of power, but also some lack of ability to, to handle the complex challenges that the world Throw, throws our way. One of the others, though, that are interesting with DAOs is their ability to work across jurisdictions, right? Not needing to rely upon a functional legal regime for the enforcement of the agreements amongst the participants themselves. And some of what people got really excited about in the blockchain world with DAOs was, oh my gosh, this can work globally. It's not, I don't have to have the ability to access a court or 
often as, the, as is the case in the country I live in, there's a really significant imbalance of power in that ability to enforce contracts, depending on how much wealth you have, right? If you are poor, you don't get to sue, generally speaking, right? You might go get a patent, great. Good luck enforcing that against the big actor when you don't have the money to pay the lawyers, right? So DAOs have a, a little bit of a different underpinning in terms of the enforcement, and that enables some, some interesting new collaborative possibilities. Amazing, thank you. Um, and touching upon what you mentioned, Matt, about token governance as well, that's gonna be our next question. And um, yeah, so I wanted to ask, With so token-based governance means that the power is concentrated in the hands of a few, so how can we balance decentralization whilst maintaining, maintaining accountability and ensuring equitable and fair governance? Should I? Yeah, I think you in. should start. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I mean, I think long term, there's tooling um, that's going to need to be developed, that is being developed, um, that can make significant changes. And I, I will leave you guys a little bit to touch on that. Um, but from our perspective, you know, we have been on board with a lot of the challenges over the last kind of three to four years um, in grappling with this kind of imbalance of power. Um, and we've been really like using a lot of strategies on the ground. Um, so for example, two years ago, we had a whale who had about 10% of our token supply was able to uh, get what they wanted done around the DAO if they wanted to use their, their voting power. Um, and that was just an unacceptable position for a decentralized organization to be in. So we realized that we were gonna have to take a lot of short to medium term steps while the tooling was still kind of growing and developing to um, yeah, make things more equitable and decentralized. So we've looked at initiatives like um, quadratic voting, which enable smaller interests to have an outsized impact on uh, a DAO's governance process. Um, as kind of interim ways to expand what a DAO can do um, and adapt to different kinds of, of needs. Um, a big trend a couple of years ago was also uh, vote escrow tokens. That's where you lock up a token for a period of time that you specify. Could be two years, four years, could be a few weeks. And then your voting power in a DAO is magnified in relation to the amount that you've locked up and the time that you've locked it up. Um, all of these strategies have been helpful in overcoming some of those difficulties. And, I'm glad to say we're in a much better place these days, um, but none of them are kind of enduring solutions, especially when you were handicapped in the first place by having all the constraints that I mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, I'm a big believer that more change needs to happen in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term. Um, so yeah, I think this is actually the crux of a big part of the problem with DAOs at the moment, right? So we've got stuck into this paradigm of one token, one vote, which is, maximally plutocratic, right? So it's like it's almost like a perfect realization of what a plutocracy looks like, right? So people who have the most money have the most power. Um, so it's like a perfect realization of that. Um, so Jack mentioned quadratic voting. Um, I read a book called Radical Markets in about 2017 uh, by, a, by a, a guy called Glenn Whale. Uh, um, and I just went and built it over the last four years. So a lot of what I've built is quadratic voting technologies precisely to address this issue. Um, so essentially what this leads to is a kind of fundamental disempowerment, a structural disempowerment of everyone in the DAO. So you can look at like Compound is one of the DeFi DAOs I find quite interesting. It just got governance attacked recently. They've got 80,000 token holders and 12 people vote. Um, and it's the professional delegates that all get paid in there to, to, to vote. Um, and the apathy in there allowed an actor to come in who essentially bought the tokens out of the market to put a proposal up that said, give me all the tokens or give me 10% of the supply, basically. So yeah, the, the, the path past this um, is mechanisms that bring in the long tail of token holders, like actually empower people. Um, and the, the path into that, I think, is like reputation and more identity-based voting systems. Um, with that comes different challenges. Now you've got civil resistance as a problem. Um, but we really need to find mechanisms for essentially ascribing trust to people beyond just how many tokens they've got. So that's where I think the sort of next frontier of DAOs will open up. Can you give people a little background on what Sybils are, what civil resistance is? So civil resistance, Sybil, um, a Sybil attack, it's named after a, a famous uh, multiple personality dis disorder case. There's a, a, a lady called Sybil who had 14 different personalities and they were like actually distinct. Um, and a Sybil attack is a person who sets up many accounts, but it's actually one person. 
So it looks like you've got like 50 people in your DAO, but it's actually one person. Uh, it could be thousands, right? Because now we've got AI and agents. I can, and like everyone's got this problem now, right? Um, so like Twitter is mostly bots, right? And there's like a thing called dead internet theory, which is actually everyone you're talking to is just like, you know, a, a kind of Russian bot operation or something like that. And actually this leads to people to being able to like mass manipulate public sentiment and things like that. So it's one of the biggest problems uh, in the world. And I actually think it's going to be DAOs that solve it because that's where it's, it becomes really obvious where it's a problem. And, and I'll just say briefly that uh, with solutions like Holochain, you know, you don't need tokens. The blockchain and it's, or current, but especially the initial iterations of blockchain technology, it's token-based technology. Holochain applications, for instance, you don't need that. But one of the things that we were really focused on was membranes of participation, right? Sometimes we're wanting to create spaces that are completely permissionless, and sometimes we're wanting to create spaces that are very permissioned. And those can be ways in which you're able to generate the coherence within a community without um, having some of these these problems that we're surfacing around with tokens. Um, we'll, we'll touch on some of the other things that come about as a result of being able to collaborate with folks without having to have people put some money in initially, because it, it enables some new possibilities, but I think that we'll get into some of those and other questions. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so what would you say are the most exciting innovations in DAO governance now, and how can they improve decision-making and participation? I can, I'm actually trying to push one today. Um, so if, if, if you, um, at the moment there's a new DAO, ZK Sync. Um, so you'll notice that like there's a lot of new L2s coming, right? We're already getting to the point where there's like way too many, L there's more block space than there is applications for people to using them. But a lot of these systems have, um, you know, quite big treasuries. So we've seen Optimism uh, and Arbitrum go really heavy into protocol DAOs, but it's ended up in a kind of mess where lots of people are making proposals on the treasury because there's like, you know, billions of dollars in these things. So it attracts a lot of people who are trying to get money out of it. Um, so what I think we need to get to is um, what I call more like a cybernetic organism type framework, right? Where instead of people come in and say, I want $300,000 to go and do this thing, give it to me and I'll spend it. Instead, we're looking at like sequences of smart contracts. So we just, what I'm pushing for is progressive automation. So we got stuck in progressive decentralization, which is like, I'll decentralize later. Uh, we should start decentralized and increasingly automate. So instead of like everything needs to be smart contracts and we push humans more at the edges. And that, that way we find like radically automated systems. Um, and actually I think we'll find a new kind of organizational efficiency that will will blow people's minds if we crack this, right? This like this is how a new organization could run. Uh, so yeah, that's what I'm trying to push for. Another area that I'd love to speak a bit more about is um, identity systems. We sort of touched on it basically earlier, um, but I think Matt and I were kind of fangirling a little bit earlier about some of the different uh, solutions that there are out there, um, and you know. Putting reputation really at the heart of your DAO instead of just token interests um, completely changes the game. It changes the way that people think about participating. Uh, it changes the, the dynamics that you can set up for how people can engage more with the DAO. Um, one project that I'm extremely excited about is called Circles. It's uh, incubated by Gnosis DAO. Um, and it's basically a reputation system where things are entirely tokenized as a form of kind of basic income. So people are earning a token every day that represents their reputation and they can then exchange it with other people in order to build up a reputation system and a network around them. And that's a, a basic primitive, which you can then build complicated applications and, and even DAOs on top of. It's something where I look back to when Beefy was founded, and I think, God, if we could have built on some of the tools that are available today, we would have built a completely different DAO from the ground up. Um, so it's exciting to think what kind of new DAOs are going to be coming and starting today um, and growing into massive industry leaders in the next few years. Yeah, and I'll share a little bit about <clears throat> one of the things that we had pitched a number of years ago uh, within the Holochain community, a little bit of an, a slightly different 
program than a decentralized autonomous organization, we pitched something called a sovereign accountable commons, which is essentially, hey, we're coming into alignment about how we want to play together, but any portion of the community can go, ooh, I like this, but I want to also run this thing over here, and they can be the bridge between those spaces. Or, you know what, I want to fork this into a slightly different version. And so that, uh, that ability for people to take something and, and walk away, it makes sense in certain contexts, right? If you're, if you're talking about real estate and controlling real estate, that might not be a context where, where that makes so much sense because you're not able to just split the real estate and copy it easily. But if you're talking about software, right? If you're building protocols together, you're building an application together, it's very easy to go, you know what, we're going to copy that and do a slightly different version and we're going to change some of the rules. And, and, and that enables an evolutionary capacity. Um, I really like what some of Nick had shared about the cybernetics stuff. I've spent a lot of time, in addition to my work with Holochain, volunteering with a friend named Nora Bateson, whose dad was part of the community that cybernetics came out of, a guy named Gregory Bateson. And a lot of the things that I think about in, in that regard have to do with, and we touched on this in our sort of sidebar conversation earlier, the ways in which reputation isn't a, a linear thing, it's a loopy thing, right? It's not that you, you know, X wallet says you're great and so I think you're great. No, no, no. Do I know that party? Do I know somebody who knows that? Have I had any indication that that's a reliable source, right? It's not university blah, blah, blah said you have a PhD. It's Harvard said or Oxford said and I've heard of them, right? And so this is a sense-making process that has to do with iterations over time. And when new information comes in, like there's a certain kind of governance attack, our sensitivity to the things that made us vulnerable to that shift how we perceive stepping into that kind of context again. So I just want to like slightly add a word of warning. And I think we need to think like exactly what you just said instead of, um, so reputation systems can end up as like uh, social credit systems on the blockchain, right? Like home, homebrew social credit systems, uh, which can end up in pure tyranny <laughs> if you're not careful. And in fact, um, there's a system at the moment called WorldCoin, some of you might have heard of it, which pr compresses all reputation down to do you have eyeballs? <laughs> and what this has turned into is to literal gangs like criminals harvesting people up, ramming them in vans, and taking them to WorldCoin orbs to get scanned, and then taking their private keys off them. So these reputation systems are dangerous. Um, so they need that kind of very community-orientated system. Things like circles are wonderful, and, um, but they, they, do need, they can end up in very bad places. Uh, and it gets really bad when someone, some government says, oh, I think we should do that as well. Uh, and that's when it gets really problematic. And I guess pulling it back to where you started, um, that's really where ZK, I think, can come into it, zero knowledge proofs. Exactly, yeah. It's an ability to build that reputation without having to give up all of the information. It's ability to separate proof from the actual person and their identity. Um, so really, it's going to be all of these technologies coming together at the right time, I think, that's going to produce a solution that's enduring, but also safe. Amazing, thank you. Um, next, we'll talk about onboarding for DAOs. So we know that onboarding new members has been particularly difficult, especially ones that aren't familiar with crypto. So, what are um, some of the strategies or tools that we can make that we can that can make this process more user friendly and accessible? Uh, I'll start with this one. I think um, so. For BV, we have been blessed with a fantastic community um, across our kind of four year history. Um, and a lot of that has come down to trying to avoid being too prescriptive about what a DAO is and what we're all there for. Admittedly, you know, you're an organization, you need to have a purpose, you are working towards something. Um, but I see too many DAOs that kind of stick to a stigmatic kind of, uh, this is what we need to be, this is how we need to operate. Um, and as a result, end up alienating people. Um, there's some DAOs that will look down on other areas like NFTs and meme coins and that makes absolutely no sense to me. We are all building the same selection of things here. And yes, they may have different interpretations in popular culture, but ultimately we're a small space and we all need to, to work together. So at Beefy, we have this, this great channel, this great group, uh, the DGEN discussions. And it's, it's not just a space for degenerate you know, investors, it's, it's a place for all kinds of different people who just love to have open, non-judgmental discussions about all aspects of Web3. And I'm surprised by how few DAOs I kind of see that level of open discussion in. That's really where I would encourage people to kind of go when they're thinking about their community is 
making it open, making it a, an exciting place to be, not just focused on your end goals. Yeah, I'll share one thing for me that feels like a big barrier to entry to more widespread adoption, not just in DAOs, but in the, the Web3 world more generally. Uh, tokens, <laughs> right? When you ask somebody for the first time, like, hey, I want you to um, set up this thing that you don't really know how to use and um, tie it in some way to your financial life and don't screw it up because you might lose everything that you own. That's a big hurdle to, to ask somebody to step through for the first time. Uh, the kinds of software that we're building, you don't have to do that. You can literally install a piece of software. Maybe you enter a password. You're not having to create a username. Your private key that's getting generated on, on the fly when you install that software is the way that you're going to show up in that particular space. Um, so you're always speaking basically to your own machine. The only reason you're needing to put in a password is so that somebody else can't just walk up and make use of your application without you wanting them to. Uh, that's pretty simple, right? So if you can reduce the barrier to just trying, then you can get people in the door. They can start to become in communication, they can begin interacting, they can begin playing or doing productive work, being recognized for that, et cetera. That's, that's a big shift. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll take this question to slightly meta level, which is um, onboarding to crypto itself, right? Um, there was a period where Ansem onboarded a bunch of celebrities to meme coins and just they were just scams, right? That's, that's, that's the onboarding we've talked about this year to, to crypto. Um, where actually, I think DAOs are potentially the way in which we onboard real people, right? Because people exist in communities. People exist in areas of interest, they have special interest groups, they inhabit spaces where they like to share their interests and talk with other people. So they're highly adjacent to how people actually exist, right? People have a real human need. Um, and if we can create spaces where people can come and bring their existing communities and upgrade them by having money to spend and tools to reach consensus together, um, and it's sort of Jack was alluding to there, that they're spaces of belonging, right? I feel welcome here. This is a cool place to hang out. Um, and I'm, actually, we can now get stuff done because we've got money and we've got ways to, to, to make decisions. Um, and that really is the killer app of crypto for me, right? If you can level up actual existing communities, that's what's gonna potentially bring in like literally billions of people because communities already exist, right? We're just creating spaces for them to be better. Thank you so much. And uh, next, we're going to talk about how to empower communities and DAOs. So we know that a strong, engaged community is critical to the success of a DAO. So what steps can DAOs take to create more sustained and empowered communities that, can act, that are willing to actively participate in the governance? We, we've taken quite a bit of uh, inspiration from kind of other disciplines within Web3. Um, as a kind of like DeFi native project, a lot of people um, look at us strictly as a kind of like financial um, project um, and see it as only a financial community that we need to build. But actually, if you look at NFTs, for example, the Pudgy Penguins community is incredible. You know, the number of kind of writers and artists who are volunteering their time to try and build culture, you know, um, based around something that kind of started, you know, with an element of silliness about it and has kind of grown into something that is remarkable. Um, so for us, uh, embracing all kinds of talents, um, encouraging artistry, encouraging creativity in and around what is otherwise quite a, a formulaic financial system um, has, been, has been crucial to building a strong community. Um, and I really think that's, that's something that we need to focus more on is how to bring in different kinds of skills into every different facet of crypto. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. I think the, there are ways for people to contribute to a system that is not just like, you know, put money in or build a smart contract and you need to find out what they are. I think there's a couple of things that I'd add is like um, shared values and shared meaning, shared mental models, if you like. Um, there's a idea I came across many years ago called psychological ownership which is the idea that if I feel like I've contributed to this, if I feel like in some way I've contributed to building this, I value it so much more. If I feel like I, in some degree I own this or I have built this, then I'm in, right? Like I feel like I'm part of this. 
So yeah, systemic approaches to actually empowering people and giving them something to do, finding the, the kind of uh, things where they can, act, like I've materially shaped this, I've had an influence. So give people influence is the path to that. Great, thank you so much. And uh, we'll open it up to the Q&A part now. Does anyone have any questions? There's one right at the back. I was just curious on the panel's opinions on uh, delegate programs in DAOs and whether it's more of a stopgap measure to deal with voter apathy or whether it has like a long-term potential. Great, great question. Um, that is another one of the kind of medium short-term measures that we are kind of looking at um, as, a, as a way to, you know, stopgap the, the apathy um, across DAOs. There have been a lot of um, successful programs kind of um, growing at the moment or, or being deployed at the moment. Um, and though, yes, um, handing over tokens to people in your community just to encourage them to participate, you know, is not necessarily something that all projects can do forever. Um, it is something that we've seen, you know, does create a lot of excitement. Um, maybe just to take a step back um, and revisit what, what are delegate programs. Um, within DAOs, um, typically it's the one token, one vote system. You might have other systems like quadratic voting. Um, but we also, within um, kind of a lot of different token designs, have the ability to retain ownership of our tokens, but pass over the voting power to a, an external person, a delegate of our choosing. So what a lot of DAOs are doing is they're saying, let's run a program where we take some of our treasury tokens and we give them out with the voting power only to community members to participate in our DAO. And in exchange, we expect 100% participation and lots more discussion from them, but they have a chance to really influence things. So far, I think it's a, a fantastic idea. And can I actually invite Nick to comment on a slightly different thing, but related in terms of apathy and and uh, compartmentalization or all yeah, kinds of Yeah, um, I have many thoughts on this. Uh, in fact, it, again, if you go to the ZK Nation sort of space where we took that for that DAO, this is a live conversation. Um, so if you look at like, the, there's a few issues with it, I would say. It's, a, it's, it's centralizing. Right, so it actually locates the decision-making power over a smaller set of people. There's a few issues with it. Airdrop day, all the tokens are distributed. I just did this recently. I'm a delegate in ZK, um, ZK Sync. Um, and it's done, right? Everyone delegates on that day. And then it doesn't really move again, right, until the people kind of undelegate and sell their tokens or something. People don't really undelegate and redelegate. So it ossifies the kind of structure of power sometimes on like day one. And then they better be your good delegates. Otherwise, you've just given all, arbitrarily given all the power to the people who were most popular on that day. Um, so moving out of that, and people are exploring ways of like reshaping that power structure by paying delegates. Arbitrum are now uh, doing delegate payment programs, but it gets into this qualitative who's made good decisions and who's done the right thing. And it can get really messy. Um, so it comes with some caveats, can get more decisions done, but I can, I literally know all the delegates on like Arbitrum DAO, I can just DM them and say, <laughs> hey, get like, I really want this proposal in, right? And if you look at who actually all the, not just that, all the delegates are the same delegates in every DAO. So we have this kind of meta level centralization problem across the entire space. So actually I'm kind of pretty critical of it. I would, um, I think it's a local minima. I think we need to move past it actually. All right, thank you very much, panelists. Very interesting to learn about DAOs. Uh, should we give in a little bit? Yeah? Nice. Um,